it's on intellectual property, innovation, and economic growth. Let, let me begin with an apology for being the, because I know that it's always uh, a chore to be present in the last session of a more than one day conference and just before lunch. But we will try and finish as quickly as possible. I promise you we will overshoot a little bit over one o'clock. But um, as moderator, I take the first uh, step and don't say anything much other than keeping time. And I request the speakers to cut down a minute from their speech, 13 to 12 minutes, and the discussants to cut down two minutes from their speeches from 7 to 5, so that we can have more audience participation. This is just a request. You are at liberty not to um, accede to it. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Amit Shavan Ray, who is Professor of Economic Development at uh, CITD, or Center for International Trade and Development in Java, the University. Uh, um, since we have very little time, I would like to make a few uh, observations to kickstart the discussion in this panel. Um, intellectual property, innovation and economic growth, I would focus my attention on patents only. So in, in a sense my talk, my 10 minutes intervention would be on economics and patents, promises and pitfalls. So why are patents important from an economics perspective? Um, if we look at the growth drivers of the present day world economy, I think there is very few in this auditorium who would dispute that knowledge is the principal driver of economic growth and prosperity at the present juncture. Now this is a fact that was uh, highlighted by Nobel laureate Solow as early as 1957 in a seminal paper where he showed that between 1900 and 1950, um, if we look at the fastest growing economy of the world of that period, that is the United States of America, and decompose the growth performance of the US, the manufacturing value added per capita growth of the US economy between 1900 and 1950, one eighth of this growth is accounted for by accumulation of capital. As we know that US is, was the most capital abundant country of the world and everybody thought this economy is prospering because of its very rapid rate of capital accumulation as per the existing economics knowledge. However, only one eighth of its growth performance was being explained by capital accumulation and the remaining seven eighth of its growth performance was explained by what is known as technological progress. So technological progress is nothing but new knowledge. And 60 years down the line, we have now enough evidence to show that knowledge is the key driver. Now knowledge doesn't fall from the sky and gets immediately dis diffused. Knowledge must be created and knowledge must be disseminated to ignite the engine of economic and social prosperity. In this process, patents play a very important role because unlike other production, if I find that production of knowledge is valuable, I would make explicit investments to produce knowledge. If I find producing Mercedes-Benz is profitable, I would make explicit investments in producing Mercedes-Benz. But there is a difference. Once I produce Mercedes-Benz, there is a ready market for it, and I can transact it. But when I produce knowledge, when I create knowledge, it's not so easy to transact that in the market because of certain properties which makes it prone to market failure in the sense if I disclose what I have created to you in order to sell it to you, then you get to know what I am selling and there is no use for you to pay for me, pay for that, uh, for that uh, uh, information. As a result, there is an issue of protecting knowledge as an asset in terms of my property rights. And patents grant you that. Patents enable me to transact knowledge in the market. 
Now, I will take you back to another seminal work by a very well-known economist, Fritz Mackler, who authored a, <coughs> a study report of the US Senate Subcommittee on Patents Copyrights in 1958. And this paper is known as the Economic Review of the Patent System. In this article, in this paper, Matlab makes four arguments in favor of patents. And he criticizes all these four arguments, which I'd like to take a mini teach to, to put it down to you, to be able to explain that it's not a very linear one-to-one -one view of patents immediately translating uh, innovation and creativity into economic prosperity. Why? <coughs> First of all, what are the four sets of arguments for patent protection a la MATLA? First, it's the natural law thesis. Man has a natural property right in his own ideas. Appropriation or use by others amounts to stealing and hence society must protect this property right. What's the problem? If it's a natural right, why is it limited in duration? If I have a natural right over my knowledge created, why is it only for 20 years? And what is exclusive possession? What is stealing? When you appropriate or use the knowledge, I still have that knowledge. So, you know, how do you, de th these are philosophical problems. Second, it's a reward for monopoly thesis, where justice requires that a man be rewarded for his services in proportion to their usefulness to society. Knowledge is useful to society. Knowledge, when disseminated and applied, makes society progress. So, Therefore, the creator of knowledge must be rewarded in the form of a temporary monopoly right, which is a patent, and this is somewhat the English position. Here the critic would be, <coughs> do you really need a reward for creativity? Genius like stars shine without pay. Useful inventions depends more on the progress of society and less on individuals. You cannot say that, you know, when scientific uh, discovery, scientific developments progress, you know, you cannot say that there is a tipping point, of course, somebody finally discovers it. But it's a culmination not of the individual's effort and creativity, but also how the discipline has progressed. And of course, there is somebody who is at that tipping point which can, who can claim the, uh, the, the, the fame to this discovery, but you cannot deny the cumulative effect of the societal progress. Secondly, even if we support uh, the reward, the head start of the first user could be a uh, reward enough. These are arguments that have been put forward against the second position. The third position is monopoly profit incentive thesis, where, which is the American position, and I, I quote from the famous Abraham Lincoln quotes, the patent system added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. So, there are geniuses around, but once you give them the patent protection, they are secured of, of their knowledge output that they create, and there would be, they would be adding the fuel of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, patents to the fire of their creativity. Now, there are serious contra counter arguments. Can creativity really be incentivized? I mean, do you really say that, okay, I'll produce a beautiful painting, I will, I will produce a beautiful composition only if I get the money? If you, are, if you are a creative person, you create. So these are question marks uh, to be uh, addressed. And finally, there is one more argument, which is an exchange for secrets, which presumes a bargain between the inventor and the society. The inventor discloses in the form of patent disclosure, his invention, and he gets a monopoly, temporary monopoly right in, in return. Now, <coughs> there are also problems with this argument. Why do you hasten to patent your idea lest someone else with the same idea bid them to it? You patent something that you can keep, cannot keep a secret. So patents, in a sense, encourage secrecy in the development stage, and no patents, an earlier publication of idea would therefore possibly hasten technological progress. So what was MATLAB's grand conclusion? This is very interesting to note, I quote, if we did not have a patent system, 
it would be irresponsible on the basis of our present knowledge of economic consequences to recommend instituting one. However, since we have had a patent system for a long time, it would be irresponsible on the basis of our present knowledge to recommend abolishing it. Which means he's not really taking a position one way or the other, having had a huge thick report on the economic underpinnings of patents, Professor Matlab could not come to a conclusion that it is to be recommended or not to be recommended. Now, the last statement, which is basically saying that it would be responsible to, uh, to abolish it, refers to a country like United States, not to a small country, and not a predominantly non needed sphereized country, where, a, where in a different weight of argument might well suggest another conclusion. So here lies the, what I tried to do is to bring to the table the problems of taking patents as a, in, a, in a linear manner where we always think patent leads to progress. I will take one more minute, if I am permitted, to highlight some of the later literature in hardcore neoclassical economics, which points out to some of the problems, general problems with patents. The first is known as the tragedy of anti-commons. When you look at this iPad, uh, there could be 50 or 100 different knowledge components going into the production of this iPad. So the producer of this iPad need to have patent rights or patent licenses over these 50 different uh, knowledge outcomes. Now, this is a classic case which could lead to opportunistic hold up. If I know that I am the 49th knowledge component owner, I could put the producer of this iPad at ransom and say pay me an exorbitant amount. This is a classic case of opportunity, opportunistic hold up in land acquisition case, for instance, which Professor Gangopadhyay uh, knows much better than I do. Uh, <clears throat> second, some of this knowledge, the, the, the producer of this uh, iPad may not even know that somebody somewhere so in some scientific lab might have created or uh, taken a patent uh, which they would be infringing. So as a result, I was hearing about patent trolls being talked about in the previous session's discussion. You know, there are companies which would start auditing scientists to search and try start taking patents on all kinds of knowledge output so that they can keep a tab on uh, the infringements that might be taking place. These are clearly instances where the whole system of patent can be used contrary to the objective of promoting progress, innovativeness, and economic prosperity. The second is the case where you have a distinction between a pure strategy to innovate versus a strategic incentive to innovate. A pure strategy is, yes, I want to create this new knowledge, and I want to innovate to make a better product and make money out of it. That's a pure strategy. A, a strategic in pure incentive. A strategic incentive to innovate would be, I already have a product. I have no intention of actually upgrading it or creating a new product or a new variant of it. But I know that I have to do it because otherwise somebody else might create that new product and my old product might become obsolete. So in order to prevent that, I do invent the new product but it may not be in my profit maximizing interest to replace me as an old product with me as the new product. So I, what I do, I take the patent as a strategic move to prevent others from coming in, I shelve the patent. This patent shelving literature is there in, again, hardcore industrial organization theory. Then there could be competitive R&D. As you know, in patents, the winner takes all. Five of you are trying to invent something. The first one, gets the patent and all the rewards. So everybody would try to expedite this and this patent date, uh, the, the discovery date. And as a result, a lot of wasteful duplicative R&D expenditure can take place, which could also be contrary to economic <coughs> progress. And finally, there is a trade-off between technology creation and diffusion. As I said, knowledge must be created and diffused 
for economic progress. Now, when you try to create, when, you, when patent tries to incentivize creation at the cost of diffusion. So this is the paradox of patents a la John Robinson, who says that patents may slow down diffusion to ensure more innovations to diffuse, which is kind of going round and round. So if we believe in the spirit of uh, the, uh, our age-old Sanskrit sloka, that knowledge is an asset which is quite unique, it gets augmented with distribution, then clearly patent which restricts distribution might also have a negative impact on the creation. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Christina Acri. She is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics and Business, Colorado College. I'm going to use lots of them to make the most of my short time, and this is the first. Perhaps the broadest measure that we have and the way we can capture best this context is international competitiveness and all the athletes. For 30 years, the World Economic Forum has conducted a detailed assessment of the productive potential of 133 countries, and IP protection is one of the key national institutions within which individuals, companies, and governments interact to generate wealth in the economy. The most innovative economies are clearly those with strong IP protection, and it's the economies with weak IP protection that are less innovative and therefore less competitive in the global economy. At a more granular level, we can draw the same conclusion from measures across individual countries. The Global Intellectual Property Center evaluates the strength of IP across countries drawing on a spectrum of 30 indicators. Admittedly, this information is most useful when we can place it in context and put it in perspective with innovative activity. Here on the left, we see the nations that are ranked by the strength of their IP, and on the right, the countries are ordered, according to Bloomberg, by their innovation rank. While there's a bit of shuffling, especially at the bottom, the tops of both columns are uniformly blue and green. The correlation across the two series is 86%, which establishes that there's clearly a link between IP protection and incentivizing innovation, both of which contribute to jobs and economic prosperity. Decades of studies across a wide variety of industries confirm that IP protection correlates with investment, increased R&D, innovation, and growth and that the absence of sufficient IP protection inhibits technology transfer and the growth that would come from it. Empirical studies, both micro surveys of the firm behavior and macroeconomic studies of the behavior of markets following the strengthening of IP rights, demonstrate that IP rights are positively linked with increased R&D and innovation. Hosts of studies establish this correlation between patent strength, technological progress, GDP growth, and the stimulation of innovation. Fundamentally, innovation is disruptive. While some jobs are lost, innovation is responsible for the creation of entirely new industries. All this although this continues to happen today, one of the best examples that we have is the mechanization of US agricultural production. Jobs were lost, but the Industrial Revolution created far more and expanded the set of opportunities available to absorb the workers who were displaced. 
The share of Americans directly employed in agriculture shifted from 70 to 80 percent of the U.S. population in 1870 to less than 2 percent of the population in 2008. Job creation, however, must be examined through the lens of what kinds of jobs. While all job creation is valuable to the economy and to continued economic growth, high-skilled, well-paying jobs are the most impactful for sustained economic progress. IP-intensive industries sustain greater long-term economic growth, generate trade surpluses, and pay both highly skilled and low-skilled employees at higher rates than non-IP-intensive industries. Strong, effective IP regimes promote high-value job creation, and countries with stronger IP regimes, regardless of size, region, or level of development, tend to see heightened high-value job creation. Looking a bit closer, technology transfer results in the creation of startup companies. These high-growth young firms generate approximately 10% of all new U.S. jobs each year. IP-intensive industries account for approximately 30% of all U.S. employment, and these jobs come with a wage premium over non-IP-intensive industry jobs. Looking beyond the United States, we find that the same story plays out for the European Union, and the same wage premiums also apply. Fundamentally, intellectual property protection enhances the incentives to innovate and to create. This is, occurs through a host of channels by reducing transaction costs, promoting disclosure, and converting inventions into transferable assets. And this translates directly into growth and enhanced trade. In the context of the United States, the shares are impressive. IP-intensive industries comprise 38% of GDP. Yet again, similar statistics describe the European Union. The link to prosperity is further echoed in the context of international trade and foreign direct investment. Effective protection of IP rights attracts inward foreign direct investment in developed, developing, and least developed countries. According to a recent OECD study of 120 countries over 15 years, a 1% increase in the strength of patent protection correlates with a 2.8% increase in foreign direct investment. Finally, I want to highlight a few details from a specific industry, biopharmaceuticals. Consider the evidence provided by the pharmaceutical industry, both in the research and development of new therapies and cures, and in the launch of new drugs. The United States provides the most comprehensive intellectual property rights, both for products and processes, for pharmaceuticals, as well as an environment free of price controls. The consequence is an unmatched level of innovation relative to other countries. While numerous factors influence whether a new drug is available in a particular market, it's important to recognize that the strength of a nation's, nation's intellectual property environment is a critical factor. Landau first showed that stronger patent and product, patents, product and process IP protections correspond to faster launch time for new drugs. This table establishes that the correlation continues to hold for available targeted cancer therapies. All innovation is val valuable, big leaps and small steps, and intellectual property protection incentivizes both breakthroughs as well as incremental innovation. For patients in the developing world, it is frequently the follow-on innovations that are the most transformative. Since first-in-class drugs are rarely optimal, improvement innovations may become best-in-class and first-line therapies. Innovative improvements have the potential to increase the shelf life or heat stability of a given medicine, to secure the effectiveness in diverse environments, enhance patient administration, and improve patient compliance. Notably, 63% of the drugs on the World Health Organization's essential drug list are follow-on drugs resulting from incremental innovation. IP protection creates incentives for people to invent and create and guards the innovation against unauthorized usage and copying. 
copying. This protection, this innovation, and this growth has real consequences, and it has significantly contributed to the decline in absolute poverty. Finally, consider the thoughts of Dr. Peter Diamandis, the founder and chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation. You get what you incentivize. Incentives are, an, are a powerful way to get the smartest people in the planet to help solve your problems. Intellectual property rights provide these incentives. To get to the solutions and growth that we want, we need them. Thank you for your time and attention. I look forward to your comments later in this panel. Thank you very much. And thank you especially for the brevity of what you have said. Our third speaker is uh, Professor Lalita Narayan, his Department of Economic for Competitiveness. Thank you, Sir Rashidji. So I'll keep it to five minutes. Very quickly, building on uh, from the comments that Amit and uh, Christina had actually made. Uh, so just building up from there, uh, I'll try to uh, bring in the whole uh, lens of competitiveness. And when we talk about competitiveness, it's about productivity with which we are actually using our resources. And that is effectively land, labor, and capital. And if you really look at this whole economic construct, then what matters is that how do we actually create prosperity? Because there are two sets of th issues that actually come to mind. One is that there are countries which get stuck into the whole aspect of inherited prosperity, just using your resources and not really, really building anything out of it. So it is about created prosperity. You, you actually have to innovate and really take it ahead. And when you talk about innovation in itself, uh, there is no doubt that it actually gives you higher returns to whatever you're doing. In fact, when you talk about IP itself, uh, IP is a competitive advantage that actually happens for corporates. So using this whole aspect, uh, if you just go further, uh, what is it that it actually matters for competitiveness or innovation? So there are four pillars, as I actually say, uh, that matter for uh, innovation. And those, those are, uh, are factors of production that is land, labor, capital. The second one was demand conditions, what locally we are actually looking at. Whatever we talk about, if we are not really accepting innovative products within the system, it is actually going to be a very long haul that we have to look at. The next thing is going to be industries and innovation that happens within them. Uh, and there is a very clear evidence within the setup here that Indian industry is not really innovating too highly. Uh, let me give you two sets of statistics here. Uh, so if I talk about academics versus the industry, uh, the researchers uh, that India has is close to about 200 per million. China is close to about 8,000 per million. And there are severe issues to what are actually happening. Uh, the second thing is in terms of the productivity numbers, like if you really talk about China versus India, which is the biggest bet that we really talk about, and productivity happens because of innovation that does happen at various levels, that processes, products, and so on and so forth. And I'm talking about China, which is not in itself a supremely innovative location as the United States or whatever. Uh, but the productivity difference between India and China has uh, gone by about four times. So the per, uh, India was and China were at the same level and now in 17 years, China is four times that of India. Uh, so if you really look at it, there is something happening within the system itself that has to be looked at. Uh, there's also, uh, what Christina was saying is something very important, that there is a strong link between competitiveness and innovation. And the moment we start looking at this data at the state level within the Indian context, it becomes very, very clear. So if you talk about Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, uh, Gujarat, and uh, uh, states like those, they are innovative states, they have actually had uh, innovative enterprises there, and so on and so forth. But the startling factor is that uh, when you talk about the states like uh, Gujarat or Tamil Nadu or Andhra or whatever, uh, we are seeing a very interesting evidence that the wage differentials uh, are there, but then the, uh, their average wages in these states are lower than the other states. So that means we are not incentivizing research or incentivizing knowledge in this country to the greatest possible extent. Uh, so when you are really talking about knowledge as a perspective, so I have an issue here in terms of saying that are we really recognizing knowledge, knowledge creation, and so on and so forth, because there is no evidence from an economic viewpoint that it is actually being given any credence. But the next thing is that if you really look at uh, uh, research and uh, development uh, and institutions that actually happen, uh, we see a whole huge, uh, what do you call, uh, non-performance of research institutions. In fact, uh, I've just had the opportunity of sitting on uh, uh, the task force of NITI on assessing technical institutions and uh, research institutions, and I can actually tell you uh, that uh, the performance of these institutions is absolutely abysmal. Uh, and that is to say the least. I always say I have a much more popular way of, or much more respectful way of saying, 
that if there are non-performing assets in the country, they are called technical institutions, including IITs. Uh, so that's a more respectful way of saying it, but then I thought I'll just keep it to that. Uh, the next thing, if you really look at is the issue of trust and competitiveness. Uh, I, I think if you really want to create very strong IP-based systems, trust is going to be very, very important. That is why IP becomes, or a strong IP system becomes imperative, because if I really want to uh, share knowledge, then that uh, whole IP system needs to be actually there. And we are finding evidence that there are issues to sharing of knowledge. We are not seeing development of clusters, and so on and so forth. Even if we actually talk about clusters, it's a very mundane thing that happens within the country, and that is actually about uh, some agglomeration of firms rather than anything else. Uh, in fact, this is again from the work that we are doing for DIPP, but I can just tell you something very, there is a very strong evidence uh, that clusters in the country are very weak because their information sharing is not happening. And that uh, we are also seeing that uh, productivity in India has actually reduced in the last four years. So if you want to take it as any evidence, uh, it is not at all an evidence against demonetization. Please do not take it that way. It is actually something else. Uh, so there is uh, a bit more that is actually happening here. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the other thing which is very important, which I really wanted to share, was that if we do not have the right IP uh, regimes, it actually distorts the competitive environment in the country. And it distorts in a certain way that if you really talk about uh, uh, distortion to access to high-quality business ideas in itself. I'm looking at it as an economic growth imperative, like all the legal issues and everything, but if I'm not able to get it right, my enterprises will not become competitive and they'll just not move ahead. And last but not the least, it's about uh, distortions in incentives uh, are actually huge negative on sharing of knowledge. So my uh, issue here is that as to how sharing of knowledge also happens. And there is also a severe issue. In fact, Subhashishji and I were talking just at the break as to how industry looks at things within the country itself. And I think uh, industry in India is uh, not really wanting to share knowledge, increase knowledge, democratize knowledge and so on and so forth. They are far more protective. It's the international firms that look at it in a different way. And so those, those, these are a few remarks that I thought I'd share very quickly uh, in my five and a half minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next discussion is uh, Barak Khan, the Vice President, Government Affairs India and South Asia. Thank you. Is it working? Yeah. So uh, excellent presentations. And what I plan to do is, I want to leverage some of the thoughts that has been already placed on the table to give you something more specific. Because we all know that intellectual property rights need to be protected. And if you protect intellectual property rights, then what happens is that it kind of generates good assets in the country. In the process, the competitiveness increases and the economic development happens. And that's what has been discussed in the beginning part of this uh, panel discussion. So what I want to say is that how do we leverage this thought and take actions to promote the manufacturing sectors of the, of the country. Because that's where we are weakest and where the government actually has been focusing a lot of attention, right? So if you look at the, the, country, the, the industry today as it exists, we are manufacturing ICT products and the government of India has taken a lot of credit that they are saying that you know, we have really been successful. But the overall sector is being very, very shallow from the point of view of contributing to the technology development, right? And that is the whole core of this debate, if you see that the battle between the SAP holders and the SAP implementers, right? You know, they are being charged huge amount of royalties and that's becoming the barrier. So that's why we are concerned, right? We aren't concerned about the technology penetration in the market because the technology has already reached. We already are using 4G technologies everywhere. So that isn't the concern. The concern that we have and where this main core of the debate is, which is kind of acting as a barrier, is that whether it is going to promote manufacturing in the country or not promote manufacturing in the country. Whether we will become a technology leader or not become a technology leader, right? So how do we address this? There are two approaches. One is that we go in a verticalization of technology path, right? We develop our own technologies, proprietary technologies, right? And those technologies can be recognized because we have a system of patent protection and we create our own products. Now what will happen is that if we do that, then we will be only cons limited to a small volumes of consumers who probably may buy your product. We will face a lot of issues from the point of view of interworking because those products may not interwork with the other products which are already there in the market and then we will face a lot of competitiveness or competitive barriers from other 
players who are already entrenched into the market. So that path isn't really looks like a very, very, you know, uh, practical way of doing this. Then what the other option is? The other option is being part of the collaborative standard, right? And the collaborative standard actually has made companies, the big companies have actually grown using the collaborative standard and where the, the whole anchor of the SEP debate is. Now, here, as was discussed in the earlier panel, that even the smaller companies participate. There's a misnomer, there's a myth that you know this whole forum is being controlled by big companies. If you are verticalizing the technology, then you definitely are at the risk of being diluted by big companies. But if you are part of the collaborative standard, then you actually participate in the whole process because this is a very robust process. And the companies who are participating in the process, which are implementers as well as technology developers, both have their own interests. They protect their interests. The market being in, in play. Nobody would like to basically take a technology which nobody wants to uh, kind of uh, provide at uh, or license at reasonable rate. If there is history, if the company actually has been using their technology as a troll and not being licensing, their technology will not be adopted. So there are, there is a definitely a kind of a practice which is being followed here and that's a robust model. So what will happen is that Indian companies who are now in the process of elevating to the next level, they can participate in the standard bodies and in the process create their own technologies and that technology can actually leverage against the global players and monetize their investment. Today they haven't made any investment. If you really see the investment of, of the overall sector, that is the basic problem of the sector, the ICT sector. The investment is less than 2% or 3% of the overall turnover. So the whole issue is not about IPR or SEP. It is about investment. So it's a, the whole thing has been turned upside down. So if we are able to promote investment, I can assure you that the companies who will invest will definitely develop, uh, you know, invest in R&D to create leverage against the other competitors to basically generate, a, a, you know, more economic value. So that's a natural course of action. Since we have not invested, therefore we are discussing this, right? So the whole issue here is that leverage the standard and collaborate the standard development process, which is the collaborative standard participate in the standard bodies, invest in technologies, invest in, in the market, in, in, in manufacturing sector with more intensity that we already have, create your own technologies and ride on the, tech, the standard development process and become a technology leader, rather than fighting that and try to basically dilute the whole process. In the process, in, you know, whatever technologies that you will end up developing, those will not be recognized and, and valued, right? In short, I, I like to just end up. quickly than the discussions or quickly revising the time. Thank you very much. So we have a lot of time for discussion. And therefore, I'm going to make just three quick points from what I uh, picked up from the discussion. You may or may not want to discuss these points. But the one point that I would like to, uh, like everybody to think about is um, there was a discussion about China's productivity being four times that of India's at the current moment. Uh, the important thing or something to think about is that China did have a very weak patent protection regime. In fact, they have been uh, hugely criticized for that. It's only now that they have a tighter um, or a stricter protection regime. Something to think about. I, I love this uh, discussion of uh, academic NPA. Um, and the, the, the next point I want to the mention is some, a bit uh, um, involved, but it does follow from the discussions and what the speakers had said. Manufacturing sector generates employment. In India, we need employment growth because we have the largest labor force and that is going to increase over time. And in a knowledge economy, we also need human capital. And human capital is not developed by the government and everybody else. For human capital to be developed, the human itself has to invest. And for that, the labor market conditions need to be looked at. So when we talk of research, when we talk of all of this, why would anybody invest in that gets lost in the IP debate. But the human capital element is very, very important and that will not be generated without labor being a part of the human capital process. Right? So and here is where the manufacturing sector versus service sector becomes important. 
because whenever we talk of services sector, we do it in the aggregate, and India is doing phen phenomenally well. But if we really think about the service sector in India, there are two types. One consists of the people who brought us here from our homes, driving the cars. That is the service sector too. As well as when we talk about the service sector, we usually are in this upper echelons, right? not realizing that India's service sector is down here. The service sector that we are talking about requires, again, investment in human capital, requires skilled people. And that is something that we do not think about when we talk about IP innovation and growth. Somehow, the labor market, the human element in this knowledge the generation is left out. And I do hope that there is some discussion on that. So with those few comments, if uh, do, the, uh, do the speakers be feel that the uh, discussions need to be responded to? There is no answer. They never answer anything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I want to reiterate that economics is just a way of thinking. So don't expect any answers from us. Uh, yeah. Yes. Anybody has any question? Yes, please. Maha, we have time not to worry. Just every time somebody finishes, put your hands up so that I can see. Good, good afternoon. Uh, my question is to Dr. Lalita. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you were talking about geographical indications and sustainable use of geographical indications and their economic potential. I have two questions. Uh, my first question is that the protection of GIs as intellectual property has nonetheless been criticized. And if we go back to our discussion from yesterday where we were, where we were going back to basics to identify why IP is property, there were two main features that were discussed. The essential transferability of the right, as well as the fact that IP rights mostly through statute encourage innovation. The problem with GI is there, if you look at the two, uh, those two features, is that since GIs are collectively held, they are not owned and transferable in the manner that traditional IP is. So there's this first criticism of I, GI being looked at as intellectual property rights. The second criticism that is leveled is that GIs don't necessarily encourage innovation. In fact, what they encourage is conformity because the local producers group that is going to get the GI tag will continue to have the GI tag only if they conform to the high quality standards of that group. So. Uh, I would like to know your responses to these criticisms when GI is criticized for being clubbed with other IP rights because it's not transferable traditionally, neither does it encourage further innovation. That's my first question. Huh? <laughs> yeah. um, you have to really speed up there. Yeah. And my second question is uh, about the costs that are associated with maintaining GIs because while GI holders may be otherwise incentivized into continuing in creation of niche markets, there is an immense cost associated with maintaining that high quality. So do the benefits from getting GI protection outweigh the costs that are associated with maintaining GI high quality? Thank, Thank you. you very much. I don't want this to be an example. This must be more brief, please. I'm sorry about so that. So what we will do is uh, we will collect some questions and then we will, uh, that will be more efficient. Yes, please. A very good morning, all panelists. My name is Ankita, and I am a fourth year law student from IP. My question is to any of the panelists, panelists sitting or anybody who is willing to answer. Uh, so, when we are talking about competitiveness in the market, my question is that IP in India, especially, we've seen a very narrow approach to the idea of exclusivity that we follow in IP. So, do you think the very approach to exclusivity in IP is actually de-incentivizing, uh, you know, competition and is leading to monopolization in certain sectors. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, please. 
In these days, we have discussed about various issues of, like the licensing, implementation of IP, and of the competition of issues. Now, this is just a thought which has been lingering in my uh, in my mind for some time. In the context of uh, the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2016 and 17, I'm talking about this contract theory and the nuts theory. Do you think these theories can help us in addressing the issues that we discussed here? I'm talking about mechanisms outside the IP and competition of framework, which can actually influence the behavior and thereby address some of the issues. Because I personally feel that many of the issues that we have addressed here cannot be strictly addressed within the framework of IP and competition law. If I, uh, do I need to exemplify the theory? Yes, I think you do. See, as to the contract theory one, uh, one thing you say, uh, the, the hypothetical example given is, say a mother wants to eat uh, her kids and go somewhere, and there is a delicious cake in the in a, a cake over there. She knows that the kids will fight over it. So the proposition that the mandate that she had given us, the elder one can cut the cake no. into two pieces in which are proposed. So you're talking about the economic theory of government. Yes, yes. Uh, should I get an the next theory? Now, now I think everybody has understood. Yes? <coughs> I guess I have, but I don't know who they Yes. No, no. Shall you I have continue? to respond so you have to make the audience understand. Oh, okay. Shall I continue? No, sir. So that's now the question is understood, I presume, right? No, I and also the nuts okay, theory. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, the first, the first, the elder one can cut the cake into two in the, in the proportion that he wants to, and the second one shall choose the piece of cake that he wants. Now, this is a system where inbuilt checks and balances are made, and the desired outcome is, you know, you can expect the desired outcome. And as to the nuts theory, the off quoted example is, uh, which has been successful in the Amsterdam airport, wherein in the gents urinal, in a, you know, <coughs> An image of flying etched into the gents uh, urinals has helped in, you know, achieving the objective of keeping the urinals clean, or say keeping the fruits uh, at, a, at an eye level, so that you you will there is a propensity to have fruits more than the junk food. So I'm talking about these theories, which can, which I think can help in addressing various issues, you know, which we have discussed in these two days. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. Hello, myself Videsh Oswal and I am a member of ICSI and my question to is Professor Lalita Narayan as she has talked about the GI. Um, my one humble submission is this that as you said that most of the product of GI are found in the rural area and uh, in the given circumstances of India I I can say that uh, which, where the small paper traders are there and who don't have knowledge about this GI rights. So don't you think so that government of India can take an initiative to appoint an independent agency who just take care on behalf of that particular region to get uh, this GI registered in uh, on behalf of uh, all the concerned person, which will ultimately uh, lead to development of that religion and uh, the economy as well. Thank you. Any other questions? And I think after this question, we'll allow the speakers to respond. Hi. Um, I find the uh, discussion of, of GIs interesting, and, and you, you've developed a very comprehensive framework. Uh, it, it definitely tends to focus more on macro issues. And kind of reflecting what the gentleman just said, I, I've, I've found it interesting in instances where uh, uh, communities have tried to develop their rights uh, or, or develop small industries, it, it can be helpful to, to intervene and develop human capital in those inter industries, uh, in, in those communities. And I think it would be interesting to add to your framework and, the the uh, idea of, of intervening in these communities, capacity building, so that the people who are engaged in agriculture or handicrafts actually become aware of global markets, aware of opportunities, and uh, and, and develop their, their business opportunities. And, and in the development economics literature, we we found that at times that these you can governments can make. Uh, really efficient 
one-time interventions because you don't you can go in, you teach the community, and you don't have to support them on an ongoing basis because it becomes a self-sustaining intervention. Once you do it once, the, the knowledge is there, it spreads through the community. Anyway, I think that's an, an interesting uh, aspect of, of the GI and traditional knowledge discussion is, is building capacity at the grassroots level. Yes, since you are an earlier speaker, I'm allowing you to speak now, even though that was supposed to have been the last question. Okay, so it's, it's to you, uh, like, you know, you made a comprehensive economic, uh, you know, sort of like Who a landscape. You, you're you're right? Right? Sorry? Who is the you? You're right? I can't read your name, sorry, you know. Christina? Christina, thank you so much, Christina, yes. So it's regarding intellectual property and innovation landscape, right? So, of course, China is an example that even without strong intellectual property rights, it developed, right? Well, it's not the only example because other countries also, they started recognizing strong intellectual property rights only after reaching or attaining certain economic development, you know, a level. It then, Italian pharmaceutical <coughs> sector, before it recognized uh, patent rights, it was innovative. After recognizing strong intellectual property rights, Rather, it was, you know, it led to the downfall of uh, Italian pharmaceutical sector. Same is the case with the intellectual property, sorry, antitrust treatment of intellectual property in the United States. Initially, it was not recognized so strongly in competition law. Competition law was used to break into the intellectual property quite frequently, but the treatment changed later on. So I believe the right answer is not that simplistic that strong intellectual property rights definitely lead to innovation development, you know, this is a question and a comment. Thank you. Okay. So yes, uh, we go backwards now, starting with uh, Nalita. Thank you so much for I'm really very happy being the last, the last session. I was wondering how much of interest is going to be there among the audience. Uh, let me start with this, uh, the question on the uh, innovativeness of the product. See, when we are talking about GI, we are not talking about something like a patented product. We are talking about those products which are coming under the handicrafts, the small manufacturing, uh, manufactured products and agriculture products. And when you talk about innovations, yes, there are definitely innovations are there. Now, I wish uh, uh, some of you had a tour around or have a, uh, in a uh, open up Google and see what are the kind of products that are produced in Kutch. If I if I take the case of the Kutch shawls, the innovations are tremendous there. And then there are innovations in terms of applying two or three kind of the weaving technologies, you know, introducing pochambali and the tie and dye. These are the innovations that can be adopted in weaving. Okay. These are the kind of innovations that are required because if you are going to be traditionally producing the same kind of thing, yes, it, the pro problem in handicrafts and other thing is that it has to be contemporary. It has to be used. When I am saying it has to be marketed, we have to talk about the next stage of uh, you know, reaching the consumers. We have to produce a product in such a way that it is being used. You know, if I'm carrying an embroidery bag, it has to be modern that I, you know, I can match it with my dress and I can use it everywhere. So that is the kind of thing that I would like. And that is what is being produced and that is an innovation. That's an innovation. That is a ground innovation that is taking place which is attracting more consumers there. And about differentiation, if, you know, if the products are mass produced, if a Kanjivram produce, if a Kanjivram sari is produced on machine, power loom, then how many people will be there to buy that? You know, my interest in buying the Kanjivram Sari or a Chanteri is that it is hand woven and there is an original silk that is there and the kind of the borders and other thing, I cannot see it in anything else. And that is the differentiation and that requires high cost. And that is what, there are, there are, when I, that's why I emphasized on the word niche market. When I am saying the differentiated product, we are talking about the niche, you know, the consumers who are willing to appreciate and pay that price for that. I know the, the Pochambili sari that I'm wearing, it's expensive. I cannot afford it, you know, but I want to have, even if I'm having one Pochambili sari, I want to wear the original. If that kind of thinking comes, then you are creating a market. To then answer the next question, there is government, government, lot of government effort to 
the file the application and that is what the pity is when the government has taken the initiative to file the application the knowledge just stops with the government department that's why i took the case of balia we because the, the time limit i couldn't expand on what i wanted to say there the knowledge doesn't get passed on but the if you take the association yes there are at least 10 people who had gone for the meeting because when you are produced in a forming a producer association it doesn't happen overnight because you will have to convince the people what is gi what help it is going to do and how it is going to benefit now and the long run okay so this calls for meeting so 10 times if i go if a producer goes naturally the person is asking what are, what are you doing so like that the knowledge spreads there is some you know awareness created yes there is something like this is there that's why we say producer association need to be involved in that but if the government is taking the next step like now the sipam has come the self for promoting intellectual property that has come very recently but i do not know how far they are going to be interacting with the consumers uh, with the producers and say yes this is indeed protected and you can use this because in the protected products what i see is that there, there is a rampant infringement that is taking place in cut shawls and in the case of manchitunam kalankari but these producers do not know what needs to be done for that they do not know where they have to go and complain and what kind of action can be taken you know the, the, the forming of the collective organization see the fundamental thing we need to remember is we are talking about small producers you know if he has to go and fight these cases he has to leave his craft which is going to affect his livelihood so there is a need for an intermediary agency which would help them and that is what is missing if you look at the crafts and the countries there is somebody who is helping this producers it's not the producers only have taken all these efforts so there is an intermediary agency which is helping which is not there in majority of the products i do recognize again that all the products that are registered with gi now cannot be taken at, on a trading platform but there are potential products you know leaf is darjeeling tea and kanjuram sari but there are products which have the potential which are recognized by the consumers at the regional level i am talking about those products you know you can create a viable market elsewhere also to make this hence this you know what you are talking about taking it to the next generation you know, we can transfer the right within the family okay so that is what i am saying it needs to be protected and efforts need to be taken yes thanks indicates that there is a correlation between innovation and intellectual property rights it's clearly not a it's not the complete explanation there are other factors at play um i think that's especially especially evident in the pharmaceutical industry if you look at the innovation that takes place in the united states it's in part linked to the intellectual property rights regime that we have it's also linked to the fact that we work in a market without price controls So I think that it's easy to find exceptions to the rule but I think that the general trends are undeniable that strong intellectual property rights leads to increased innovation. To go back to the comments about um investment and research and development and intellectual property rights there was a study done by Shapiro and Mather in 2014 in which they contrasted the experiences of India, China and the United States. and they concluded that if india achieved greater levels of intellectual property protection equivalent to those of china annual foreign direct investment inflows would increase by 33% annually if they achieved the levels of intellectual property protection equivalent to the united states the benefit would increase by as much as 83% annually estimated to happen by 2020 drawing that out to look at research and development spending um contrasting the experiences of the three countries between 2009 and 2014 in the United States their ability to attract global R&D spending um went from 34% and then dropped to 31%. Over the same 5 year period China's share rose from 10% to 18%. India was at 2.7% of global R&D spending. Okay, come in. in the reverse order first first i'll take up the issue of uh, ip strength of ip and innovation and here i think we have to agree to disagree because uh, simple correlations and overall trends at the macro level are problematic 
cross-country cross -country studies are problematic in this respect. And um, if we look at the historical evidence, we find uh, that Germany is a country which is known for its creativity and innovation. It adopted a strong patent regime in 62, almost after a century of its industrialization experience. So therefore, the strength of the patent regime, the one-size-fits-all approach is completely unacceptable. It has to be tailored. And I think I hear uh, from all the participants and the discussions that we have to have an appropriate patent policy to facilitate and foster technological learning and catch up. And that has to be kept in mind. We cannot have a linear view on this. Let me give you an example from India. India adopted, changed its IPR policy in 1970. It uh, relaxed its patent regime inherited from British India. And we had the so-called process revolution in pharmaceutical industry in India at that point, which brought India to a new pedestal of creativity and technological capability, at least in this sector. So therefore, this one-to-one -one is really problematic. And I would therefore go by the general uh, view that I'm hearing. It has to be tailored appropriately. Now, <clears throat> coming to the point of uh, narrow approach and exclusivity uh, in IP, please do understand that IP is a monopoly right. So therefore, if you expect patents to foster competition in that sense in economics, you are mistaken. But the reason for providing this temporary monopoly is to foster an environment of competitive learning and competitive technological progress. So therefore, please don't get confused. Yes, of course, for the, for the, temp for the duration of the patent, this firm which creates this knowledge will have a monopoly right and would have a monopoly uh, position in the market. But that's the whole point. But that's the whole point. You have to have that reward to the creator. And here, let me again, because I have now got another minute uh, uh, to speak, which I <laughs> speak uh, uh, over and above the 12 minutes that you gave me earlier. And you wasted uh, 40, 10 seconds of uh, this also. Now. <laughs> Now, you see, what, what, where I did not make, uh, I, I, when I said that patents, you know, is it really to incentivize creativity? Maybe not, but you know, when uh, a, a knowledge outcome comes into the mind of the scientist, it comes. But taking that outcome to the marketplace is a huge process, which requires immense financial investment. And unless you are assured of the monopoly right, it will be very clumsy for any entrepreneur, any businessman to take this idea from the scientist's head and make the investments to take it to the marketplace. So in a sense, there is a clear logic of why we need a patent protection. But at the same time, please do understand that there are pitfalls of patents which I pointed out. The market itself creates these pitfalls. You can have patent shelving. So you have to build in appropriate legislative mechanisms. You know, you invoke uh, compulsory licensing if it's not used for a number of years or whatever. So, you know, the whole idea is to make sure that you have a patent regime, an IPR regime in place, which fosters innovation, learning, progress, and prosperity in the context of the country that we are talking about. Thank you. Thank you and, and on the contract here, may I just, uh, perfect. You know, you, are, you have actually hit the nail on the head. There are alternative views which are coming up as to how to overcome this market failure of, you know, transacting knowledge. For instance, you must have, you must have heard about open source discovery, which is one mechanism designed to make sure that innovation and contributions continue notwithstanding individual patent protection. How well it's working, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm told that you know, it's now moved beyond IT into uh, open source drug discovery also, which is being experimented in India. It was actually Sami Brahmachari's time. They started it in a big way. So of course, there could be alternative mechanisms. And as Shubhashis does said, you know, please don't expect yes and no binary answers from economists. We are supposed to give you a nuanced view and please accept the non-linearity of a social scientist's perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on that last bit, I just want to make a comment and then we will uh, close the uh, session and I presume the conference. The, um, that is on that last bit what um, Amit said is very, very important. You know, this thing back during the Industrial Revolution, right, we solved the problem, namely the problem of investment and shares, the whole concept of shares was developed, the legal concept of shares, the accounting concept of shares, the economic valuation of shares, all the disciplines came together and developed a solution for the problem that we had of lump sum investments and not putting all your eggs in one basket for those who are taking the risk. So I'm sure something similar will come up in this modern era too. And therefore we all need to work together to do that. And it is in that context that I, wish that there was some discussion on the distinction between what we call business innovation and what we would call product innovation. Because much of the discussion that took place, if you notice, right, for only some types of innovation, those are issues. But we are clubbing them with all innovation. So it would be nice to distinguish between these two. Right? For example, platforms, you know, something that we discussed, is an innovation that has a completely different set of um, uh, issues compared to a better medical equipment, for example, okay. uh, or pharma. So therefore, you know, we need to be able to distinguish between product and uh, business innovations. And the other thing is the role of the government, which I'm, I'm sorry, sir, your question was not directly addressed, but I think that that was a good point. It especially comes up because uh, Professor Narayanan talked about, or at least made a mention that NABAR stays for only three years. I think it is important to understand that yes, the government is required, but the government's involvement must be well thought out. And the most important plan to think out is the exit plan. The government policy, all policies in supporting innovation must have an exit plan. And we need to, you know, that discussion. On the other hand, to say that everything the market will take care of is also not correct. So we need to have a more nuanced approach in what we bring. Unfortunately, we usually end up taking positions, which may not be the best way to proceed, but to find the right balance for what suits our society and our context. On that note, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Uh, Before we invite Vice Chancellor, National University Delhi, to address the audience here, I'll just request Dr. Gongopadhyay to please hand over the mementos. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, panelists. And uh, uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Professor Ranbir Singh couldn't make it for the welcome remarks, but he also wanted to see you all. And uh, at least thank you for coming. And uh, I would now request Professor Ranbir Singh, my honorable vice chancellor, national university. Begin with uh, Yogesh and Arun for putting this together. Uh, 
thank you, Arun. Thank you, Gays, for organizing such a event. The, the entire credit goes to these two, two people, those who run the center of uh, IPR from the National University of Delhi. The, the idea to have this program actually germinated when we were at Washington. And uh, I'm, uh, Professor Adam Mosoff and we had a meeting there. And then we decided, can we uh, do something, uh, some kind of a collaborate program? And the, I'm so happy that the idea has taken shape in the form of a very wonderful conference uh, today. I also have to acknowledge the presence of many friends from, uh, especially uh, George Mason, and then from this university, Professor Mark Sulj we have. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, program. Old friends like, uh, very, very old friends in fact. Uh, we have Jay, Kaysen, Parbuda, Ganguly, thank you very much for being with us. Geeta is uh, again uh, a very old friend of the university. Uh, Professor Ramakrishna again from National School Bangalore. Thank you, Ramakrishna. And uh, Professor Sain Connor, uh, thank you very much from the University of Washington, Seattle. All this has been uh, possible because of your presence here. Uh, I could not come yesterday because suddenly I was called by a very very, very dear friend of mine uh, at Lucknow who wanted to organize a program. And I had to suddenly go. And I, I missed the inaugural that way. But uh, today we, I have come with the good news. And the good news is that the uh, HRD and the UGC recently, uh, they have released a list of universities uh, which will have more freedom. It may not be very important, but it is important for uh, new institutions like us. Uh, where the, it is very important to share with you because it will bring a lot of benefits to NLU Delhi in person. It may not be important for universities like JNU, those who I already have that kind of a autonomy and freedom, but <laughs> no, you don't have. <laughs> I, 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 I always believed because you talk of a lot of ajadi, I thought you have a lot of autonomy. <laughs> Since they talk, <laughs> talk about a lot of ajadi and uh, I thought they must be having freedom and autonomy as far as the uh, autonomy of what kind, uh, that's a debatable point. So then, then uh, the, the idea which I want to share with, especially with my foreign faculty friends is that this will mean that it, the university will have uh, freedom to start new courses single-handedly with or with universities outside India, it, we can have off-campus centers. Like this was not allowed earlier, now you can have off-campus centers. I don't know whether you can have beyond the boundaries of India, I, uh, I wish that freedom will, will be there. So it can be explored. And then uh, another kind of course like skill development is a is a buzzword in the Indian government today. I don't know what is the skill development kind of thing. Research parks and new academic programs. The most important thing for me to share with you is they will have the freedom to hire foreign faculty. They, they, they can request foreign faculty to come to NLU Delhi or uh, those universities, those who are in that list. Uh, they can be there for a semester, for a year. Now we can invite foreign faculty into the GAN program the Global Initiative for Economic Network, we have been inviting a lot of people on that. But the, this, this will be a bigger freedom, and we have been always saying that we, are, we have dearth of faculty. But fortunately now, probably, if uh, this means this, then we'll be able to invite more, more people. And all foreign students, we can have more foreign students on the campus. And also, uh, another important thing for the faculty would be, universities would be free to give incentive-based emoluments to the faculty. Well, if you want to give IIT scales, fine. JNU will be the first probably to give the IIT scale. <laughs> no? You don't have that Azadi? <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, so but this is, but, but the, uh, I thought 
good thing to share with you is that as far as NLU Delhi is concerned, we are not a very old university. And in the country, the state universities, all law schools are state universities, we have been ranked at number six. And in uh, Delhi, we are at number two. Number one is here. Number two is here. In that sense, because in, in Delhi, uh, we, we are at the top. And uh, we are at number six in the state uh, list of the universities. So these benefit being a class one status university. All these benefit which I talk to you will come to NLU Delhi. So I don't know whether that would mean a lot of freedom to NLU Delhi or not. So I thought I'll share with you. Thank you very much, all of you, for being with us and organizing this wonderful program, and especially for all the speakers in various sessions. And thank you very much for inviting me here. Thank you. This is in law evidence. <laughs> evidence. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, uh, finally, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been uh, almost one and a half intense days, including the dinner yesterday. We can count it as two. Um, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, speakers, panelists, uh, the audience, students, most importantly, uh, you know, who are patient enough to attend both the days. And I see the numbers. You know, in the morning, I was like concerned, but uh, by uh, I think forenoon, we had uh, many of you here. I would like to thank uh, National University of Delhi administration, and uh, most importantly, all of you by now know Shrinkala and uh, team of student volunteers, right? I would not be taking names of all of them, but then. You can imagine that in organizing such a big conference uh, uh, with around 200 participants, I know there were a lot of people who were doing, uh, you know, uh, invisible, uh, you know, uh, they were invisible, but they were always there and they always helped you. But I would, uh, you know, most of, most importantly, thank, thank my colleague uh, Arul, uh, you know, for being very supportive. And also Shrinkla, who is actually the coordinator of the conference and you have seen her uh, more often. So I would call upon Shrinkla to accept this token of our appreciation. And of course, uh, Professor Mark Schulz from uh, George Mason University. Thank you, Prof. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a nice lunch and then uh, we are done. Thank you. <laughs>